the spirit who comforts us, the spirit who convicts us of sin in our life, the spirit who sanctifies us, bringing us into conformity with Christ, into union with Christ as we, as we seek to be more and more like him each and every day. Have you felt that work in your own life? The Holy Spirit is perhaps the least understood person in the Trinity. I'm pretty sure he's the only one that's ever referred to as it, which is incorrect. But you see, there, rarely, there, there seems to rarely be good balance on what people and churches make of who the Holy Spirit is. In, in charismatic and, and Pentecostal churches, they can tend to overemphasize the Holy Spirit, which runs completely contrary to his own desires. In Reformed circles, they can neglect him altogether. And so sometimes people will say of Reformed churches that it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures. The nine o'clock group got that because <laughs> I think that's, they are my frozen chosen. <clears throat> but you see, that, that, that diminishes the Holy Spirit's role within the Godhead. But today we are finally going to get it right. After 2,000 years, someone finally got it right. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> That's our prayer, at least, and so we, we would be wise to, to do that. We, we should pray that the Lord would help us this morning uh, as we come to his word uh, and we seek to know and love and appreciate him all the more. Let's pray. Father, I'm aware that we, we are different people with different backgrounds and we have different understandings, uh, uh, nuanced understandings of who your spirit is uh, but Father, we are praying for a clarity. This is not a professor standing and giving information to students so that they can regurgitate it for a test. This is, this is real life. And, and so Father, as there is a lot of information about who the Spirit is and what he has done, I pray that it wouldn't just be put away in the mind and then perhaps forgotten or recalled here and there, but that this would take practical uh, place in our hearts and in our minds because we do seek to grow in our knowledge and in our insight and in our appreciation for who you are. We seek to grow in character. We want to be people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so, Father, we pray for our minds to be focused and attentive uh, as we seek to grow in these things. And we know that that does not happen apart from the work of your spirit. And so for, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would indwell this place. As you indwell each of the believers gathered here, that you would uh, uh, be glorifying Christ in, in all that we say and do. And Father, that, uh, that you would be present in this place. We commit these next few moments to you and we commit indeed the rest of this day and week uh, to your care that you would watch over us, Father, that you would remind us of these good things, that they would help transform our lives into that image of Christ, for we pray this in his name, amen. Uh, a priest is walking through uh, a jungle and he comes across a, a ferocious lion. And the only thing he can think of to do is to pray and he says, Father, would you please instill your Holy Spirit in this beast? And all of a sudden, the lion stopped, and this bright light was shining behind him, and the lion put his paws together and said, Father, thank you for providing this meal for me today. <laughs> I, I made this mistake at 9 o'clock, but I have no real transition from that. I'm sorry to say. Who is the Holy Spirit? As we said before, he is not an it. He is not a force. He is not impersonal. 
but he's a real and distinct person. And it is possible for us to have a personal relationship with him. Paul concludes his second letter to the church in Corinth by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We have fellowship with him. And just as the Son is not a creation of the Father, so the Spirit is not a creation. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal. But unlike the Son, the Holy Spirit is not visible. He is spirit. He is described as breath or wind, as Drew alluded to in his prayer. He is in perfect unity with the Father and with the Son, and he does not speak anything contrary to the Father and the Son. He does only as he sees the Father and the Son do. He is fully God, and he never works outside of the will and pleasure of the Father and the Son. He is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of the Son. But what is it that he does? does what is it that he what does he do well the new testament portrays the holy spirit as active at every stage of redemption and as we said last week especially in the life and the ministry of jesus consider these uh, mentions of the role of the holy spirit just from luke's gospel Jesus is conceived of the Holy Spirit. Mary is told that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her. Therefore, the child will be called Holy, the Son of God, from Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel compares the Spirit's role in Jesus' conception with his work at creation. Again, as Drew had mentioned in the prayer, when, when the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. You see, Jesus was the author of the new creation, begun through the overshadowing work of the Spirit of God. Then when Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 41, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and the baby inside of her, John the Baptist, leaps with joy. After Jesus' birth, uh, uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus go to the temple and they come across this man, Simeon, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit had revealed to him that he would not see death before seeing the Christ, the Messiah. Later in Jesus' public ministry, John tells his followers, John the Baptist tells his followers, I baptize with water, but one is coming who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And at Jesus' baptism, where we see the whole Trinity the Spirit descends like a dove when the Father speaks and says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Then the Spirit leads the Son into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan in Luke chapter 4. And then just a few verses later, Jesus enters the synagogue and teaches from Isaiah where he refers to the Spirit of the Lord resting on the Messiah for his work, declaring that this is now fulfilled in himself. You see, Luke is telling his readers that Jesus himself was governed and directed by the Holy Spirit in all that he did. His ministry as the Christ, the anointed one, was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And do you want to know what the good news is here in all of that? It is that that same Holy Spirit is in the believer. He is in you and he is in me. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Parakletos, a parakletos, another like himself, a comforter, a counselor, a helper. There's really no one word in the English language that captures this. 
A picture that might help us is that he is like a defense attorney. He, he is one who speaks on our behalf in opposition to an accuser, or in our case, the accuser, Satan. He's testifying that we are children of God, that we are heirs, that we are co-heirs with Christ of this salvation. And more than that, he is our comforter. He reminds us of what is true. He reminds us of what is right. He reminds us of what we need. He is our intercessor from Romans chapter 8. He, he helps us in our weakness and through word, wordless groans, he intercedes according to the will of God. And he puts us in union with Christ. This is a really important theme throughout the New Testament, this union with Christ. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 about how the believer dies with Christ in his death and is raised to new life in his resurrection. And the only way that it's made possible to have that union with Christ for us to die to sin, to die to self, to be raised to new life is for the Holy Spirit to put us in union with the Son and with the Father. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us that we can grieve this Holy Spirit, that, that when we sin against our holy and righteous God, that we can grieve him, but that we've also been sealed with him once and for all. And so in the grieving of him, we, we recognize that we've grieved the Spirit, and we return in, in, in faith and in repentance to our God but you see, the helper cannot come unless the son departs. Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 16, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. How could it be to their advantage? Wouldn't it be better to have the son? Well, the Holy Spirit could not have come in full Christ-exalting gospel applying, new covenant fulfilling deepest sin convicting, Satan defeating power while Jesus was on the earth. And the reason he couldn't is because every one of those expressions, every one of those expressions of power is based upon the death and the resurrection and the ascension and the rule of Jesus Christ. And that, that those had to be done before the Holy Spirit could glorify them. In other words, the most basic ministry of the Holy Spirit in this age is the glorification of Jesus Christ, crucified for sins, risen, triumphant over Satan, forgiving sins on the basis of his shed blood, ascending to triumphant glory, kingly power in heaven, and coming again, that's what the Spirit glorifies. That is what the Spirit glorifies. He couldn't and he cannot glorify that until those things take place, which is why Pentecost is such an important date. It is the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, allowing them to speak in the languages of the people who were there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks. You see, it is a undoing of the Tower of Babel where man in his uh, desire to be like God builds a tower and, and God sends confusion of languages so that they don't understand each other and they're incapable of building the tower. And you see, babe, uh, uh, Pentecost is the reversal of that, the, the undoing of the languages that separate. And so people, Jews from, from all over are coming in who speak different languages. And the, uh, the disciples are able to speak in their tongues 
in, an under, in their understandable language, and they're able to hear and receive the gospel, which converted thousands to the good news in Christ Jesus. It is the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out, bringing back to the disciples' memory all that Jesus had taught and all the things that Jesus had said and all the things that Jesus had done and that those things were later written down in the gospels, in the Bibles that you have with you. And they were preached to the nations as those people were scattered out from Jerusalem, just as Jesus said would happen. So the spirit is sent when the sun ascends to heaven. But the Spirit also brings conviction on the world. Jesus continues in verse 8 of John 16. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. We see that the the resurrection and the ascension show the world to be wrong. It it convicts the world about the justice of Jesus' crucifixion and, and, and proves their guilt. When Paul's preaching at, uh, at Pentecost, and he essentially ascribes blame to everyone, uh, you're to blame, uh, the Jews are to blame, and the Romans are to blame, and God is to blame because he's the one that sent Christ and, and, and died, uh, had him die for the atonement of sins. But now the responsibility is on you to receive and respond. But you see, it proves their guilt. And the Holy Spirit's work is to make, clear, make that clear after the resurrection. And then in verse 11, we read that concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Well, when did that happen? When was the ruler of this world judged? That judgment of Satan was accomplished in the death and resurrection of Christ. We read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, that he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Finally, in verses 12 to 14 of John 16, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. In other words, he will glorify Christ. John 16, 14 is perhaps the most important sentence about the work of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. He will glorify me. Specifically, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ's resurrection glory and his achievements over sin and Satan on the cross. That's the, that's the peak, that is the, the apex of the glory of Christ in the gospel. And in glorifying Christ, the Holy Spirit brings the elect of God in. He he is the one who opens the blind eyes. He is the one who unstops the deaf ears and brings us to see with spiritual eyes, with real eyes, what Christ has done, what Christ has accomplished on the cross. He brings us to see the love relationship between the Father and the Son. This is what we're talking about at the beginning. If you're resounding with this, it's because the Spirit is saying, truth, truth, truth. He brings us to see the the love overflowing from the Father to the Son through the Spirit in in the creation of the world. He brings us to see the, the redemptive rescue plan of the Father and the Son for lost creation because the Son accomplished Redemption, but that redemption needs to be applied to people to be effective in their hearts, and that is what the Spirit does. 
Has the Spirit done enough yet of the things we've listed? Well, he does still more. Not only was he active in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ on earth, not only is he active in the life of the believer, not only is he convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, not only is he bringing glory to Christ, not only is he bringing us to salvation, but he also illuminates the word of God for the believer. You see, the, the, the effects of, of sin on us is to veil or to shroud our minds in darkness. If, if our fallen nature, in our fallen nature, we, we are naturally creatures of darkness. Right? This is what John's prologue is about in John 1. That the, the light has come into the world, but men's hearts desired darkness. And yet we are in desperate need of light because we were created for light. We're created in darkness, but for light. And though, of course, Scripture itself is light, we could read it and not understand a word of it. And so this needs illumination so that we can see and receive and understand and appreciate the light. The same Holy Spirit who inspired the, the writing of the scriptures is the same Holy Spirit who works to illumine the scriptures for us, for our benefit. He, he, he sheds light on light. Take this building, for example. I wonder if you've ever driven by late at night when it's pitch dark, maybe on north side or you're on I-75. If you've ever seen it when the, the lights are out, all you see is kind of a, a dark mass on the side. It could easily be a shopping mall or a hotel, which I think this actually almost was a hotel. But you don't know what it is. You, you, you could tell something's there, but you can't make it out. But, but when the floodlights and the, and the up lights that, that are placed around the building shine on the building, you could see the stained glass windows and, and you could see the cross at the very apex. And you say, oh, I know what that is. That's a church. Now, my Catholic friends have told me they think it's a Catholic church and it's called Our Lady of I-75 <laughs> or, or Our Lady of the Interstate. It's not a Catholic church. <laughs> but do you see what that does? Do you see what the light does? It turns a dark mass of nothing and, 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 and obscurity into something beautiful. The light reveals, it shines, it makes clear. Illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit. He, he illuminates the word, he illuminates Christ in his word for us, that we can rejoice in them, that we can have him, that as we said before, we can be in union with him. He helps us to hear, to receive, to properly understand the message of God's word. And he does not reveal new revelation that is, that is uh, beyond what is said in scripture. He, he only illuminates what has already been revealed in scripture. Do you see the work of the Spirit? Have you felt that work in your own life? The Spirit who comforts us. The Spirit who convicts us of sin in our life. The Spirit who sanctifies us, bringing us into conformity with Christ, into union with Christ as we, as we seek to be more and more like him each and every day. 
The Spirit who opens our blind eyes to see the truth of the gospel, to comprehend the gospel, to, to, to love and appreciate the gospel. The Spirit who does not elevate himself, but instead elevates the work of Christ and the work of the Father in sending Christ. The Spirit who illuminates scriptures for us helping us to grow in knowledge and in insight, as well as growing in character and and bearing the fruit of the Spirit, helping us to love, to have joy, to have peace, to be patient, to be kind, to be good, to be faithful, to be gentle, to have self-control. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity. Do you you know this God? 